Howdy, uh, welcome to Lightning Talks. We won't be talking about spicy may mayo. No one signed up for those, <laughs> but thank you, Ruth. Um, no all right, cool. So, yep, uh, we will start in a couple of minutes. I just want to give a quick uh, shout out to our sponsors again. Uh, Equinox for the platform, ECDI for the captioning, though this session will not be captioned. So just want you to be aware of that. And uh, keep you for the Hackfest tomorrow. I just sent an announcement out uh, for sign up tomorrow. So let me know if you don't have that. Otherwise, uh, the website also has information. So uh, each presenter is going to do five minutes of talking. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ruth, I guess whenever you're ready to go, take it away. Mm -hmm. We'll get started in just a moment. Or if you want me to start now. Uh, go with your heart. Okay, I'm going to hold on for a second and take a deep breath. <laughs> Conscientious, son. <laughs> well, knowing Ruth, she can always use an extra minute. Can always use an extra minute. Yes, but I'm going to try to like stick to it. Okay. We're like 15 seconds out, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, in So I'm going to talk about Friends of Evergreen Indiana. And I will tell you, this does not actually exist yet, um, except for in my head where it's been for a very long time. I put this little caption down here at the bottom because um, I am in a mode in my life right now where I've heard a lot of reasons why we can't do big things and they're, they're probably pretty uh, legit and I don't care anymore. Um, I think there are a lot of big things to be done and I would like to do something for Evergreen Indiana and I've been thinking about it for um, I think we're, we're nigh on six years. And so we're going to do it one way or the other. And when I say we, I'm going to hopefully encourage people to join me in this. So a little brief history. I mentioned 2018, I was leaving Evergreen and Evergreen, Indiana to take a job outside of the nest. And um, I did not know how to let go. I had been, spent my entire career to date um, in the evergreen ecosystem as well as um, in the consortium. And I loved it, um, but, but needed to move on for some reasons. And, uh, but I still wanted to stay connected. Um, but I didn't, I, I, if you remember being in St. Charles, I actually did a lightning talk then about this uh, topic. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna talk about it again but I didn't have time to actually think more about that. And that was good, honestly. Uh, in 2019, not too long from 2018, I actually had the opportunity to come back to Evergreen, Indiana, and thereby come back into the community of Evergreen proper. And I came back with a lot of new perspective based on my time out of the fold and also being in a in different type roles. Uh, and I would say that my perspective um, expanded and I might have matured a little bit in that time. With that and with circumstance, I had a renewed desire that was also mixed with my core values. There's a whole lot of like therapy in this last statement here um, that has to do with uh, still wanting to support resource sharing, which is a core value for me. Um, open access and open source that is not, however, tied to like some of my internal problems. And you can read through that. And if you ever want to talk about like Jungian psychology, I would love to talk about that. But anyway, moving on. So um, the idea was that uh, we'd start a Friends of Evergreen Indiana uh, modeled on the Friends of Library groups that are around. Uh, but this would be to support the consortium. And as I was thinking through this, one of the things that came coming back was that you have to, when you are doing something big, pick um, accomplishable goals and also define your purpose. Oftentimes, if you're talking about an, ex an organization for existing, you can't necessarily rely on people understanding what the heck you're, you're talking about. So the goal for this group um, in my mind at this point is uh, to focus on staff acknowledgements, that being for a staff of the uh, admin 
for the consortium as well as member libraries, raising funds to support local grants and scholarships and to partner with local friends of the library groups who oftentimes also struggle in ways and really want to do more than they're able to accomplish because it's all volunteerism and other things. Uh, so to be able to partner with them to support their fundraising initiatives as well. And I have a little picture here. I got a laser and I will talk to you ad nauseum about it at some point if you want to. But one of the things that I used it for was to create um, some little um, things to give to our customer uh, or circulation support department at the Indiana State Library for all of the work that they did um, during our time of troubles when it came to the transits. So what are we gonna do next? We're gonna have a meeting. We're gonna have an interest meeting and that's basically a call out. Following that, we're gonna have a founding meeting for those people who really want to be involved in building up the structure for this. And then an introduction to our member libraries as well as their any existing friends groups that we identify. And then we're gonna start doing the things. And I want to end this with the idea of sharing the goodness um, I'm reminded that at, at one point I had a conversation with somebody and I've had this conversation following that with many somebodies, uh, but in that initial conversation, it had to do with us doing good work and we do good work. And when we are able to uh, really acknowledge that and acknowledge others who do good work, it fills us up rather than empties us. And so I think that this is a great opportunity for me to support something that I have loved, um, but not because of any other reason that I just believe to my core that it should be supported and to bring others along with that and to share goodness as far as we can. We can do big things. So scan the horizons and do big things. Okay, that's it. That's what I got. Questions, anybody? If not, my five minutes is up. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ruth. Um, yeah, you can also me, post questions anyways. <laughs> All right, uh, Debbie, you're next. All righty, let me get my screen shared. All right. Oh, I'm at the wrong side of my presentation. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, and I am here to give our annual um, documentation interest group evangelization. So um, uh, there have been comments in various programs before this about documentation interest group or DIG. Uh, and so, <laughs> yes, Kate, that is our mascot. I found this uh, on our, uh, anyway, it's free. Um, so documentation interest group. Um, one of the things you will notice, and here we have Louis McKenna and Margo Morrison, um, incorrect documentation is often worse than no documentation, but no documentation is also not great. Uh, so what is DIG? Uh, if you have not participated in DIG before, um, and here is Tara Bunsnyman. And uh, so DIG is a documentation interest group. And I have here on the link uh, to our wiki page on the Evergreen Wiki. We meet monthly, uh, first Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is 1 p.m. Central, 12 p.m. Mountain, and 11 a.m. Pacific. And we meet on Zoom. And uh, we also meet at the Hackfest at the conference. So please come to the Hackfest tomorrow. Uh, and we will be working on documentation stuff as well. Uh, and then uh, some folks who are uh, doing documentation also are able to go to the Hackaway in the fall. And this fall, that's going to be in Massachusetts. Very exciting. Uh, and then we also have a discussion list, an email discussion list. Um, and so that is evergreen-documentation at list.evergreen-ils.org. Um, and state of current documentation. And here we have a picture of Dinah Dorsey um, that uh, in the last year, and this um, 
I didn't want to bug Andrea because she had presentations before and after this, but so for the 2023 year, rather than from the last conference to now, um, there were 215 documentation commits, and that is compared to 111 that we had in 2022. So we have we have a more yeah. than 100% um, <laughs> increase. So that's so awesome. Uh, most of the work done this year was on 311 and 312. We've also discussed 313. Um, and uh, we had a whole bunch of new documentation contributors. So uh, various documentation, small and large. And we are so uh, excited about all of you being involved. Uh, and we had a lot of big projects over the last year. So um, we had uh, projects and some of these spawned sort of subgroups or their own um, working groups. And uh, so we had reporter documentation improvements, library settings documentation, um, permissions descriptions. So this is working on defining every single permission that we have. Um, item status documentation, we had Angular staff catalog documentation, and uh, we upgraded our Antora version, which is where what our documentation is housed on. Um, so thank you for everyone who worked on these projects um, and all the other documentation projects. And we have fantastic uh, committers who have also been doing tons of work getting all of the documentation put into Evergreen. Uh, into the, uh, the official docs. So we have our monthly meetings, um, pretty much monthly, with collaboration, discussions, decisions, and demonstrations. And we continue to have pet show and tell. So this was a thing that we started during the pandemic when everyone was home. Um, and uh, we still have time for pet show and tell for folks who are still at home. Um, so, but even with all of the big projects that we tackled this year, there is still a lot to do. Um, and here we have George Bunce Nyman. Um, so you can look over your area's workflow, um, look over where that is in the docs and make sure that it looks right. Keep them, the documentation current uh, for new releases, edit it, uh, report problems on Launchpad or by email. We try to make it as easy as possible. Fill in never documented features. Uh, and submit documentation related videos. And if you're looking at documentation, this screenshot here at the bottom, report a problem with the documentation, click on the DIG mailing list. That is an easy way to just uh, get in touch with us. Um, so this uh, screen has Charlie Fitch and um, this one literally made me go, oh, <laughs> when I got it. Uh, so, um, all of these ways that you can help, there are a lot I talked about already, um, but participate, submit documentation in any kind of format, um, attend uh, meetings or hack fests, uh, or assign yourself topics from the projects list um, that's on the wiki. Oops. And we have so many folks in dig now that I couldn't fit everybody's pets on the actual document. So here we have Lady Morrison, Francis Pringle, Pepper McKenna, Theodorcy, and Zoe Lukenville. And I'll just let you all peruse this beauty for a second. So thank you to everyone who does documentation, everyone who does release notes and contributes in any kind of way. And here on this screen, we have Naya Lukenville and we have a picture of Andrea working on documentation while she is backstage at the Adams Family rehearsal. So dedication and documentation. And that's all, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Debbie. All right, uh, Josh is up next. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're coming in fine. Great. Um, so I'm just going to go through how we automated our hotspots, um, deactivation and reactivation. And so the problem we ran into is that there is no incentive to, uh, and I'm Josh from Lake Agassiz Regional Library in Minnesota, sorry. Um, there's no incentive to return a hotspot if it's still working. And so we were had been going through the carriers method, which often took several days to happen. Sometimes they just never actually did it. So it was very error prone. Um, we really wanted them to be activated when they were returned right away so the next person could use them. Um, we have, 
about 100 hotspots at our 23 locations, and there's five to 10 that are being overdue each week. Uh, doing it manually was just taking too much time, and mainly it was that whenever my coworkers would normally handle it, were uh, had time off and I had to deal with it. I just hated having to do it. To do it, um, repetitive tasks don't like. So we use Franklin Wireless Hotspots, uh, the um, 4G um, models, and they have a mobile device management solution called Pintrack, which uh, is very poorly publicized. It's very reasonably priced. We've been using that for about a year just to manually deal with our hotspots. Um, and in itself, it made it much easier to activate them and deactivate them. Um, there wasn't any API that they documented. Um, and so it sort of seemed like a dead end. But luckily, Chrome developer mode to the rescue I could watch to see what requests were happening when I would log into their uh, portal. Um, and uh, it, it took took a little bit of work, but uh, I got something running. Um, they do use MS, SMS for two-factor authentication. Um, and uh, I should just say that I did actually contact them and tell them about my usage. So it's really OK. They they are fine with uh, Evergreen Libraries doing this. So here's just a little chart. Um, every five minutes, a script runs and looks for hotspots to activate or deactivate. Um, then it logs into Pintrack. Um, I use Twilio to get the SMS authentication code to my script. So uh, they send a code. It goes to Twilio. Twilio communicates that to our Evergreen server. Um, and then it uh, sends the code as a Postgres event. Uh, the script picks that up, logs in, and finishes up making the changes to the uh, hotspot. Uh, um, so the activation deactivation um, happens by just changing the uh, Wi-Fi name to something that's longer than 32 characters. And hopefully, they never fix this because it's really convenient. If you do that, it disables the Wi-Fi. And it also shows that message on the screen so that it, when they go to use it, uh, when the customer uses it, they immediately see, oh, it's hot, it's overdue. And uh, when, uh, and you just turn it back to the normal name to reactivate it. Um, and these changes actually get pushed out with an SMS message. So they happen within seconds, um, which is really nice. And we also send out like an email to the branch, letting them know that the hotspot's been reactivated so that if somebody, oftentimes we have somebody else that's waiting there for the hotspot and wants it next. And so having this all happen quickly is really nice. Um, some improvements I'd like to make in the future um, is just the how it's set up to find hotspots that are, need to be activated and deactivated is sort of convoluted. So um, I, there's some improvements to be made there. Um, maybe look at using action triggers instead of just running it every five minutes. Um, if uh, we don't actually um, use the evergreen filtering, but we could somehow hook that in so that you know adults and youth could have different filtering groups. And uh, it'd be nice to talk to Pinterack into using something other than SMS for their API, because that'd be a lot easier to set up. And here's a few links um, where I've got our code. Um, the uh, mobile beacon is the uh, carrier we use, uh, Twilio, the script repo. And they actually they have a set of 5G hotspots and at a separately branded uh, MDM now that I haven't looked at yet, but I think in the future I will check that out. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. All right, we have Jennifer up next. All right, can you hear me? Because I can't find the Zoom button, but I think I'm I'm unmuted. Excellent. Yep. Um, yeah. Um. Thank you. Uh, so just really quick, um, some of you may remember, may have seen 
back in September, uh, a some emails to the listserv evolved into some discussion about doing a staff training roundtable session. Um, because we talk about a lot of things in the Evergreen community and training gets talked about in conjunction with other things. Um, but to my knowledge, we've never gathered all of us who do training and said, okay, what do you do? What do you do? What do you use? So the topics that have come up so far is, you know, what training or courses do you offer? What works for you? What have you discovered doesn't work so that, you know, you can pass that knowledge on to others? Um, what types of resources do you create? And what are you using software tool wise to do your training, create your resources, potentially other topics as well? Um, I, and yeah, Debbie's saying in the chat, I'd forgotten about the staff training. Um, I kind of did too. Um, but I looked at the calendar and I'm thinking if it works for others that end of August, we could pick a day at the end of August. These are the four days that currently have no community meetings scheduled um, and do whether it's a two hour or three hour mini interest group or I guess interest group meeting esque without becoming another interest group um, just to gather all of the us who do training um, so that we in part know who else does training um, and know who to reach out to. Um, I'm also uh, looking for volunteers. Um, so if there's anybody who would like to help organize that day, I don't think it'll be a lot, but it'd be good to have at least one or two other people to chat with about what would work for people. Like, do we stay two hours? Do we th say three hours? Um, I think we need somewhere on the wiki to gather resources together so people can post what they have um, so that it makes it a little easier for people to go and find out what other people are doing. Um, and as well for that day, it would be good to have some people lined up who are prepared to talk about what their organization does as, as well as as far as training, um, as well as having time for people to uh, discuss, uh, talk about what they do. Um, but I think to have the uh, the session go smoothly, um, it'd be good to have some people already queued up to talk about that. Um, and then my email is there. Please feel free to reach out for me. Uh, sorry, reach out to me. Um, and I see I've got Jennifer Weston and Debbie uh, in the chat as volunteers. Excellent. Um, and yeah, um, that is my spiel. Let's get together and talk about what we do with training because I want to know what other people are doing. Cool. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, Dan, now's your time to shine as our uh, last minute ad. All righty. Let me just figure out how to share my screen here. Um, all right. Perfect. So you should see a picture. I'm stealing from Debbie this, this idea of showing cat pictures, um, because much like my little buddy here, I'm wondering, how did I get here all of a sudden? Um, but here's actually a picture of them in better times. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about age-based hold protection. Um, and um, I kind of just agreed to do this like 15 minutes ago, so I don't have any slides prepared, but I do have this data viz um, that I created um, sometime within the past couple of weeks that looks at um, our uh, the OWL library systems uh, hold captures for items created in 2023. So you can see here that um, the majority of our items that were added in 2023, 40,000 or so out of just under 70,000 items um, were added with age-based hold protection. And you can see that, um, and sorry, I should mention our age-based hold protection is a two-month rule. That's the only rule that we have for our consortium. Um, you can see that the effectiveness of it is is not super great um, because just after a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you're looking at like less than like 10% or so of the items being captured for holds, which means that the items are 
sitting on shelves or, you know, also want to acknowledge kind of what's missing from this um, visualization that um, they also could maybe have been checked out like through like serendipitously being on the shelves. But for the most part, the big thing that you can see here is that after that age-based hold protection expires, all of a sudden we have a noticeably larger amount of items being captured for holds in weeks nine and 10. And I see that as um, a, a resource sharing failure. Um, that means that these items were kind of just sitting around not getting into the hands of patrons when they could have been because here they are being captured for holds for those patrons finally able to move from one library to another. So um, we discussed this with our um, uh, advisory committee. Um, we're looking at changing this and basically looking at possibly getting rid of age-based hold protection entirely. Um, probably going to rely a little bit more on um, the hold sort order tools. Um, part of the reason that we looked at this is, first of all, there was a, a question on the consortial leaders listserv a couple months ago about whether or not people were like actually looking at whether um, their uh, age-based hold protection was effective. Um, we also have Aspen, and um, age-based hold protection isn't indicate indicated great there. Um, and so rather than kind of looking at like creative solutions, we were set, we basically decided, well, can we make the case for just getting rid of it entirely? And I think that's all I have to say. Are there any questions? Sorry, I didn't have a chance to look at Zoom chat real quick. If not, then I'll sign off. Okay, thanks everybody. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, Jane, are you okay to go? I think I saw you pop in here. Yep, I made it. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Um, did my the correct screen show up? Does it have a slide? I no. see it in a it's small. It's the presenter slide. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll try the other one. Thanks. Yeah, okay. there we go. Hi everyone, my name is Jane Sandberg. I work for Princeton University Library, and I'm going to talk about what Evergreen could look like if we change some of the priorities, I think, in how we um, do development. And I put this under fiction because I'm going to be mainly telling a story of what I think that could look like. Um, so I'd like to introduce our main character, Ash, who's a children's librarian. It's a few weeks before summer reading and Evergreen's missing a feature that's going to cause them a lot of extra duplicate annoying work um, during the busiest time of the year. Um, Ash talks to the system administrator at their library, whose name is Phoenix, and they take a look at the issue together. And one of the first results they see is the new developer's wiki, and it says exactly how to make the kind of change that they need to do. So they give it a try together and make a co code contribution with the feature that they need. Um, a few minutes later, uh, an automated robot contacts them and says, I've run thousands of tests against your contribution and confirm that your contribution isn't going to break anything in Evergreen. And that gives them a confidence boost. Uh, the next day, an actual human talks to them, thanks them for the contribution. Um, they notice one thing that's missing. Um, so they give them some documentation about how to, how to add that missing piece and then teach the robot for future contributions to check for that, that missing piece as well so that the robot can catch it in the future. Um, Ash makes that change, and the next day their contribution gets added to Evergreen. Um, Evergreen puts out a release um, the next week with a new feature, and then Phoenix, the system administrator, goes ahead and upgrades Evergreen in a test environment that very day and into production the next day. The downtime is not hours, it's seconds, and they can upgrade in the middle of the day. They don't have to come in in the weekend or early in the morning. It's fast, easy, and reliable. They get that into production right away. Um, the children's department can get that feature in time for summer reading. They can train on it before they have to use it. And they even have a chance to spark some ideas about how to make it better. Like maybe move it from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen. Um, since everything's fresh in, in Phoenix's mind, since it's only been a few, few days at that point, they know exactly which file to change and they 
add that as a new contribution. What gets in the way of that is the current um, the scenario. Um, so this is how long it takes for contributions to make it to production currently. So this is for um, releases in the 312 series. It took um, on average 172 days of waiting before a contribution was added to Evergreen. Um, it took an additional 34 days after a contribution was added to Evergreen for it to get released so that people could start, start um, using it from the tarballs from the, from the website. And then upgrades are hard. Um, we had a whole pre-conference that was really excellent, by the way, about all the complexity that goes into planning an upgrade right now. It's not something right now where you can just set it off in the middle of the day during summer reading and trust that you're going to have just seconds of downtime and, and get your features. We do have resources. We have incredible, amazing, experienced developers. We have amazing libraries who pool their resources to, to make some cool development happen. Right now, that's going a lot towards new features, towards new bug, uh, to, towards bug fixes. It's going towards um, um, rewrites, which are, which are important. But what I would propose is that we spend like six months instead prioritizing the following. And I think we might get those features and bug fixes a little faster if we pay for these things and prioritize these things, which historically have just been left for like, oh, if you have time or, oh, we're not going to fund that, just um, hopefully you can get to it in your free time. Releasing frequently, reviewing pull requests. There are over a hundred just waiting for somebody to have the time to prioritize those. And we, I don't think we ever pay for that, that type of work to my knowledge. Making upgrades smooth and automated tests. I think everybody who knows me and has heard me on this soapbox before has, saw this coming. But um, automated tests, I consider them to be our safety net. They allow us to do really bold things with the software because at the end of the day, we know those tests are going to catch us if we do something that breaks the system. Um, I'm really inspired by these two books by Gene Kim, The Phoenix Project and The Unicorn Project. They are novels about IT and how kind of a continuous delivery mindset of being able to get changes to users um, can, can really make a difference. Um, and I want to thank everyone who tested, signed off, offered feedback, committed code or documentation, collaborated on a release, wrote documentation, discuss the release process um, or upgraded to a new version um, because all the work that you've done um, moved us toward that vision. And that's what I've got. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jane. And thanks, everybody, for lightning talks. Uh